thrashed my computers, my big screen TV. Took my blender. What about jewelry? Nope. What about silverware? Nope. Just my blender. Blender, huh? Love that blender. You know, I did stuff when I was a kid. You're not breaking and entering, but, you know, stuff. Yeah, we all did stuff. I just wish they hadn't stolen my damn blender. Seem a little attached to this blender, Robert. Oh, well, some people meditate. Some people get massages. I blend. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dave. Thanks for joining Bob and I for our podcast, Thriving in Dystopia. And even though we always try and be professionals, sometimes we swear. So just know that going in. Fight the power. Whoa, 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 fight the power. We got to fight the power that be. What up, Bob? Good. What that is a good lead in. What is up, my friend? Hello, Davo. Do you think of me as your friend? I, I do. Yeah. You're my friend. I have a new friend. His name's Dave. Yeah. I think of you as kind of like, uh, um, like a virtual acquaintance. That's right. Maybe we'll meet one day. Yeah. Hey, let me tell you about Facebook. You know about the meta? I know that they rebranded. And they call themselves Meta, and that they have the Metaverse. Yeah. Do you know what other dystopian um, world is known as the Metaverse? Oh yeah, that comes from a dystopia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can't you probably wouldn't know it. It's uh, cy- cyberpunk. It's like the birth of the cyberpunk, which is a novel called Snow Crash. Hmm. Yeah, I remember that one. Isn't- name is like neil stevenson um the main character is a pizza delivery driver and his name is hero protagonist (laughs) nice yeah but it's not really like a it's not like a comedy like a terry pratchett or a douglas adams but his name is hero protagonist i think that's pretty funny um and like the whole metaverse is like filled with these like little hubs like like little neighborhoods and they're like owned by corporations, you know, it's like, check out the little Caesars Plaza, you know, and it's, everything's just like owned by the corporate world in the metaverse, which is kind of like a funny branding of Facebook to choose that. Yeah. I feel like more and more corporations are not even dressing up their evil intentions anymore. Hmm. There's like, yeah, we're yeah. Just, we're gonna start the dystopia. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Um, friend of the show, Albert Cook, works for Meta. Did you know that? No, I didn't. And uh, he has, he's like part of the Facebook. Uh, sorry, he's part of the VR team. He's on the virtual reality team. Wow. And sometimes they'll be having a meeting and they're like, Hey, you guys want to go into the meta? And they'll go into the meta. It's, it's kind of amazing and kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. If it was somehow led by an anarchist consortium of people across the world, then I would be more excited about it, but that it's led by Zuckerberg. Um, it's only going to lead to bad things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. nothing that guy has done has been positive. It doesn't seem that way. At um, lunch yesterday, my mom said, do you think Mark's in over his head? <laughs> I said, oh yeah, mom, I think he's over in over his head. <laughs> kind of got away from him on that one, didn't it? It did. Yeah. Anyhow. How you doing, Bob? I got a week off, more or less. Um, and pretty excited about that. I'm pretty exhausted at the end of my quarter. Yeah. And I would love to just hang it up. I feel like we've done enough. I don't think there's anything else we need to do, but we have to come <laughs> back for 
two weeks after this. Yeah, it's pretty weird, huh? I, I've been thinking about that a lot. Why these two breaks are so like tied together. And at this point, it's too late. You can't change it. But boy, I could have used a week off about a, a month ago, you know? Yeah. That would just work so much better. I think so if it was in the middle. But I mean, that's kind of what they try and do with the spring break, right? To take, I mean, you do it a little bit different at your college, but it's like we've been working so hard. This is like week 15 for me, you know? Oof. And then, and then it's like one week off and then three weeks on and then two weeks off. It's like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, why didn't we have a little more time dispersal throughout the semester? Yeah. Because the United States Empire decided it needed to put Thanksgiving a month before Christmas for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And who knew that it would have such an effect on two poor teachers? Yeah. The mess for teachers. Yeah. Uh, are you going to do anything for the, the big break besides grade papers? Yeah, I'm excited to grade papers and get, get myself back to a decent place with all that. And, you know, Dave, I've, uh, haven't got to tell you this, but I've been experiencing this weird health situation where this is day nine, um, where I, I'm having this lightheadedness where hmm. just like I'll get lightheaded. It kind of feels like, a short lack of oxygen to my brain. Um, it's hard to describe. It's also not dizziness. So I'm not experiencing like loss of balance or anything. Um, it just feels like, you know, the, the thing that feels closest to us is when you're smoking weed, cannabis for, for the youth. Um, and like you, you get that like hit and it kind of feels good. Um, but when I'm experiencing this, it doesn't really feel good. It doesn't really feel bad, but it, it's say like the fact that it happens a lot. It, yeah, I don't know that it's not painful, but it is disconcerting and discomforting. Um, so, but today is quite a bit better, I would say than the past eight days. I would have loved to have gone and got my vitals checked. Um, but to do that would cost over $500. Um, after insurance. So I was, you know, it's like not, I'm not having any other symptoms. So I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to monitor this. And if it gets worse, then I'll go to the doctor. So my, my best sort of diagnosis of myself is I think it's like a partially caused by low blood pressure. So Mm. what I've been doing is trying to hydrate and eat salt. Um, and I think that's slowly working. I think it's also caused by stress and who knows what other factors, but I think the low blood pressure is part of it because mom, mom and dad both have low blood pressure. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. So really this break, I'm trying to like de-stress, take things slow and try to hopefully that'll reduce yeah the stress side of it and continue on my, my hydration and resalting. So no, no big plans besides that. Um, Resulting. I was wanting to do something a little more collective and political for what I'm calling thanks to Indigenous Resistance Day. Uh, but I think I'm not going to be able to manage too much, but I did teach about it in my class and that felt good. We talked yeah. about the Indigenous Resistance to the Line 3 pipeline, the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline in Minnesota, which is another Standing Rock situation. Um, yeah, but yeah, maybe I'll come back to that, that during our, our theme, but I want to pass it back to you and see what you're up to this week. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll take, take a second to plug, um, Julie's work right now and, um, mostly to you, but also to anyone else who's out there in listener land. Uh, Julie's like started to take clients for her herbal practice and she centers around a lot of different things, but 
mental health, nutrition are some of the big ones, but also just like it's it's a helpful thing to do to check check in with a practitioner about your health. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm I've been I'll I'll probably end up using. It's good for her too because she's like this is her third year of herb, herb school, and she. It's a cool time if you see Julie. You get to like be part of her caseload, and then that case gets brought to the big, like all the third years, and then the resident physicians, um, or physicians clinicians, and they sort of analyze the cases as like a group. So if you're interested in that at all, um, yeah, I guess I highly recommend that to you, Bob. It might be helpful for you to like get an, an outside perspective. Um, yeah, but it sounds like you're on the right track with the resalting as they call it. The great, the great Bob Mays, the resalting. They'll call me the great salt lake after this, Dave. Yep. And, but I don't know. Yeah. I think too, like I've, one of the things I've been thinking about is I've had this like weird ankle inflammation for a while, like six months now. Um, and I'm like, been doing acupuncture for it, but, um, yeah, I think it either has something to do with my like physical body or my nutrition, what I'm eating. And I wanted to give you this piece of information, Bob, that, um, like food intolerance, like Julie was telling me about this like triangle of symptoms that you can feel. Most people are attuned to like how when you have a food intolerance, you'll typically feel, uh, feel it in your gastrointestinal system, right? But you can also feel a food intolerance, like an allergy, food allergy in your like joints and mus, like muscular skeletal system. So like you, Julie's like, maybe this ankle thing has to do with your diet, you know? But some people feel it in their mental health too. Um, and like, oftentimes experienced as anxiety. So I feel like that's an, it's just like something to notice about your, your health and your, as far as with nutrition, to like have that in mind. But I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if this is necessarily a nutrition thing, but it's also just like, it always comes back to stress, you know? I yeah, feel like I stress is good to a certain point, but then when there's too much of it, it just leads to some really bad symptoms. Yeah, I also think it's probably related to my diet in ways that I don't quite realize, so I do appreciate that advice as well. Yeah. Well, you can go to the... If you want to book a session with Julie, just uh, email her or you nice. know, whatever. Text her. Yep. She's had two clients right now, and she has two on docs. So that's pretty fun. That's awesome. That's really, yeah. that's just amazing. I love that. It's pretty, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Wait, and we got our way back when in episode six or something. I was thinking the same. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's just like that world of possibility at the start of a break. It's the best feeling in the world, isn't it? Um, and it starts to close in pretty quick, I'd say. But I'm still feeling like the world of possibility. I'm going to try and take care of all those things that we always like, ah, I can't get to that. Maybe like on a three day weekend or come Thanksgiving break or something, you know? Yeah. Um, like our oven has been broken since we, we got it and I'm finally like looking into it and I ordered a part to fix it. Um, so I'm going to try and fix that this week. That's my big, my big job. <laughs> but I feel like those are the type of jobs that are always like, it, it just could take a whole day, you know? And then it's like, wow, one whole day. That's like, I'd kill for a day most weeks, you know? And here I am going to like dedicate a day to try and fixing an oven, you know? But we'll see. It'll, it should work out pretty good. Yeah, and other than that, I'm just going to go eat turkey at Helen Maisler's place. That'll be good, among other things. Um, and that that's pretty much going to be the week. Like, 
chilling, lesson planning, doing a few Mr. Fix It projects. And then, yeah, the big celebration, um, food fest. And definitely going to try and participate in By Nothing Day. That's always a, a big deal. Um, but I always end up buying something like, uh, so like a thing of cilantro or like a light bulb or something that I'm like, damn, I blew it yet again. So we'll see if I can actually do it this year, Bob. That's great, Dave. Yeah. I appreciate all of that. And yeah, maybe when you have your oven fixing day, you can set it up with, I don't know, other things you can do at home that feel like you can be somewhat multitasking, listening to podcasts, listen to 60 songs that explain the nineties. Uh, they're oh, down yeah. to their, their last 10 songs and I've created my own list of the 10 songs. I feel like they have to do. Uh, nice. So, yeah. Maybe I could send you that list and you can, you can participate in that. Yeah. I think you have already actually sent it to me. It's in my cool. email, but nice. I haven't looked at it in about a month or two. That's good. What's your number one song that you're hoping they do, Bob? Um, my number one song that I hope they do is something by Rage Against the Machine, and I think they'd probably mm. do Bulls on Parade. Nice. And did they do Smells Like Teen Spirit? No, that's my number one that I feel like they have to do. Yeah. Culturally. Yeah. Yep. Culturally. Um, sweet, Bob. Well, we better get into it a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, let's do it, Dave. Let's get after the have to. Now that we yep. got the, now that we got the, what have you out of the way? Good, good. Um, yeah. Do you want to intro this one, or do you want me to? Um, yeah, I'll I'll give it a quick intro as best I can. Um, we are talking about, uh, man, Valerie Kaur. How do you say her name? Uh, I I always go to the pronunciation guide beforehand. Uh, core, core, Valerie Core, yeah, K A U R, and the Revolutionary Love Circle. And I won't get into it too much, but we are t- doing about uh, the circle on see the stranger. Is that what it's called? Uh, see no stranger. Yeah, um, and sort of thinking about we're like doing the. F- the three ways to transform from stranger to friend, I guess, or ally. And yeah. the, the steps that you go and first you start with wonder and awe, and then you go to grief. And we sort of talked a lot about, um, how grief is a lot with like vulnerability and being vulnerable with each other and sort of seeing the person. And this week we're headed into the, the outer circle that is called the fight circle. And yeah, we thought a little bit about, you know, the idea of action and acting together. But I think that's just where I'll leave it. And you have some good prompts for us today, Bob. Yeah. Good intro, Dave. Yeah. I'll start by reading her two pull quotes to get us oriented to the way she's thinking about this. So Mm -hmm. the first one is, when you love someone, you fight to protect them when they're, when they are in harm's way. If you see no stranger and choose to love all people, then you must fight for anyone who's in harm's way. This was the path of the warrior sage. The warrior fights, the sage loves. So that's the first quote. And then the second one is, the fight impulse is ancient and fundamental. These ancestors fought with swords and shields, bows and arrows, because they had no choice. They did not have a sophisticated matrix of legal and political avenues to defend civil and human rights, nor international law to mediate conflict between nations. We have these avenues today. We no longer need literal weapons like our ancestors, but we could still learn from how they marshaled the fight impulse in the battlefield. And so I want to go back to what you said based upon like that fight impulse in the battlefield because you mentioned taking action. And I, I think that is at the heart of fighting, um, taking action and having agency. And so the two prompts that I want us to think about are, 
um, one, like how do we take action and keep agency when we understand the structural conditions of society are so challenging? And then the second one is around thinking about what our bows and arrows are or shields and swords. Like what, what do we feel like personally? Uh, you know, we use to fight. I want both of us to comment on that. And so I just want to say a little bit more about the first prompt. So the f- first prompt is around. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I, I was thinking about this in two ways. One is that Embridge line three pipeline up in Minnesota. This is just another pipeline battle that we've. We know well from the Standing Rock pipeline battle against the Dakota Access pipeline. Um, and they have been fighting so much, so long, um, for a long, long time. And they have been doing the things that Valerie talks about, like connecting, you know, there's indigenous people connecting with like white farmers and they have a great base, right? I think like, um, there's a survey done and 94% of Minnesotans do not want this pipeline. Um, and, but in spite of that, Enbridge kept on winning these legal battles. Um, you know, they had enough money to buy the right politicians. And so we, we've seen this before as well. Um, and I was, you know, thinking about the, this, this week, um, was the, um, the, I'm not going to say his name, but the white supremacist kid who went to Wisconsin and killed two people with the AR assault rifle. That, that trial ended this week and we knew what was going to happen. You know, we were not surprised when he was found not guilty. Um, so we understand like how stacked the system can be and is, you know, and it makes us mad, but we also, see it coming and that can lead to this like so why bother attitude and i think the fight is like saying no like you it's really important to understand this the structural conditions of white supremacy and capitalism but ultimately that's going to have to make us fight more um and i wanted to pass that to you to think about like what do you do to not to keep your agency when in these, in these times, like you can comment on like the trial or other things. Um, and then I'll, I'll comment on it too, Dave. Oh, yeah. I, I guess it gets my head reeling a little bit, Bob. Like, how do we, let me rephrase the question as I'm hearing it and see if that feels right to you. Cause you gave a lot of headiness there and my brain went a lot of different directions, but I sort of see the question that you're asking is like, how do you keep hope alive in these battles when it feels like they, by they, I I just mean like in general, it feels like we're fighting against these corporations or governments that are trying to like get rid of our agency to work together to like fight for a better world. I feel like, the question you're asking me yeah yeah i think that's really well said yeah like connecting how do I, like we need hope i like that you brought hope and like hope is connected to fighting like i think maybe we're only going to fight if we have hope mhm yeah that is that is true like there like even in my like most desperate times i feel like hope is still in with me you know um I feel a lot of times resigned to the idea that like the world is already reached a breaking point. I still, I guess there's a a lot, a big piece of me that feels like the world hasn't. Yes. Like the quote unquote capitalist world or the world, um, you know, has reached a, I guess like the, this like late capitalist world that we live in has reached a breaking point. And I don't think that it's going to be able to turn back in a way that, that we won't have struggle. 
Um, but I don't feel like that means that hope is over for all humanity. And I feel like that's a, kind of a important distinction because I guess there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, well, it's all, it's all fucked. Like we've gone past like the carbon point. Uh, what it, what is the carbon point in the air? Like, um, I want to say 360 or something. 350.org. Um, yeah. 350. Is that what it is? Yep. Anyway, anyway, but like we've, we're like at 450 or something like way past it. And so like we can't go backwards to like stop this like catastrophe that is global climate change, you know? Um, and or for instance, you know, we're at a point with our economic systems that there's, there's too much invested and that, you know, they say too big to fail. Right. But like at this point, like all these economic systems are going to come crashing down and it's going to like erase what is this like phantom economy of capitalism. And to me, it's like, yeah, that's going to be horrible. Like we can't, we can't put the oil back in the ground. You know what I mean? Like we can't do that. And we can do like little projects, like cleaning up the oceans out of plastic. But it's like, even that is like kind of a fool's errand, I think. And, um, more like showboating than anything else at this point. Uh, so I guess like, but here's the thing. I don't think that that means that the world, the world as we know it may be forever changed and we can't go backwards, but that doesn't mean that our, that there's nothing left worth fighting for. You know what I mean? Like we will still, there will be some semblance of like the world that we live in. And there will be some semblance of like humanity, I think. And there will be animal and plant life left. You know, I, I feel fairly certain of that in a thousand years that that will all still be a thing, you know? Um, and so I guess I just want to like keep fighting for love and hope and peace. Even if that means that like there will be struggle with that. Um, and to me, I, I think that that's the essence of where we go. If we roll it all the way back to the trial, um, and just all the battles that we've fought or we've seen be fought over the past years or in our lifetime. These are the battles that are worth fighting and they will lead to a world like as long as we are fighting with hope and love in our hearts. then I think that's the world that then, that, then hope will continue to exist as long as we, we continue to hope, you know? So, I guess to me, like these bigger battles are like what, you know, what gets me going to get to work and to teach kids or to like, or whatever work, fixing ovens, you know, we, we do it with the idea that we will make a a difference in this world and we will be doing it together because that's really all life is to me is like, let's do this. Like, we can work for love and justice or we can work for greed and hatred. And I, I say like, well, we might as well do the the right thing. Is that it always fuels my fire with hope. It's good stuff, Dave. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, I, thanks, Bob. I enjoyed hearing it. I resonated with me. Um, yeah, your yeah. emphasis on like relationships and love and like just, I even think like you're, you're saying about the oven, like, yeah, like even just doing the oven, that's, that's beautiful because it strikes something. This is like not equivalent, but it is in these moments. I think of Viktor Frankl, who spent like three or four years in German concentration camps and, um, he was in Auschwitz for at least one year, maybe more. And he was in pretty solitary confinement as well. 
And people asked him how he got through. And he wrote that book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he's like, I don't know, but it's just like something in me found meaning in every single day. Mm. Whether it was just like, I saw the grass grow just a little bit more this day. Or like something very minute in his environment changed. Um, and that gave him meaning. Um, so that is like the oven, you know, just like doing things like that is very important. Actually, you know, I, I find this same thing about like doing dishes. Like when I do dishes, I feel a little bit better after I'm done. Um, so I think the mundane task, you're right. You're onto something there as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it's also a process too, right? Like finding out our oven was broken was pretty sad. And I was like, well, do we just get a new oven? Like, is that the path we're going to walk down, you know? And it, we might end up with a new oven after I break this one. Um, but it's also like, it gives you a chance to be like reflective about a project. And like, can you, like, it feels like a big project, but also it's just like really cutting two wires and then tying them together and then it's like four screws. So it's like, that's not that big a deal. It really isn't. Um, and it's like, you just got to go step by step. It does feel really scary to like put a new igniter in an oven, but I think it's just like anything. Um, and I feel like a lot of like hope with the idea that maybe we won't have to throw out like a perfectly functional heat box, you know? Um, and that this we'll get some more years out of this and yeah it's like i think the idea of fixing something yourself is really empowering too you know because like we had a friend that recently had to re- do the exact same job and it, he hired a company and it cost him 300 dollars um just last week and it's like oh maybe we could do this for 30 bucks and that would feel pretty sweet but like it's like those are like little empowering moments. But I do want to just flip it on you real quick. I also feel like part of this like idea of like we fight for those we love in our inner circle. We don't want to see harm done to them. And if you like take that out and be like, if we put everyone in our, our, our in that circle, then we'll fight for everybody. And I love that idea, but I also feel like that feels really exhausting to me. Um, I feel like personally there are people that I do that for, that I'll do anything for, you know, it's really hard to open up that circle at times because there's only so much that I can give, you know, without getting drained. So I just wanted to say those words and see if you want to respond to that at all. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that's a good point. And I resonate with that as well. I think that there's another like set of thought processes that I see on Instagrams that act- activists talk about the importance of boundaries and like setting up good boundaries can change people's lives in really positive ways. So I think, um, maybe like that quote from Valerie is like for, people who are really closed up or also like in theory, yes, everyone deserves to be fought for. Um, but we're all human and we can't like l- quite literally fight for everyone. You know, we have only a certain amount of battles, like to pick your battles, I think is very legitimate response to that. Um, and always be like, we should always be learning and like trying to connect with more people. Um, you know, but I think it is, I think for someone like yourself, maybe like boundary setting is actually the more proper, um, or not proper, but like helpful strategy. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, but I, I think I'm going to actually just make sure we talk about our shields and swords, like what we bring to the table when we're thinking about the fight. Um, can I interject uh, real quick and then. We'll, we'll talk about shields and swords. Yeah. I guess I, I don't know if you prime this in me, but I, there is this piece when you 
maybe what, what Valerie's talking about is let's, let's like root for everyone to like, like not root against anybody in some ways, you know, like, like I think one, one truth that we both feel is that like, it's racism and institutional racism leaves no, like everyone's a victim of it. Meaning that, and yes, some people are more victimized, of course, you know what I mean? And these systems of power, but I, I think that, you know, and maybe you'll be able to say this better, but the idea of like being a white male has like, there's like a lot of power that comes with that, but also there's a lot of like, uh, I'm not quite saying it right, but we're like, we're victims of this, the systems of oppression too. Does that make sense? Did I say that quite right? Yes. Um, uh, y- you know, yeah, I think you said that well. Like we are also victims of the systems of oppression, not that we're oppressed, but we are also, um, yeah, yeah, victimized by this system or yeah. I think that's close to how I see it. But I don't want to, I don't want to say by any means that I feel like. Like, let's have a, like a, a sob circle for white men right now. You know what I mean? But I'm just saying like these systems of oppression really like if we had like equality and equity and like true justice, I feel like that'd be a world that I would much rather live in, you know? Anyway, the point being is that like really we need to fight for everybody to I, and against the systems of oppression and we need to fight like for, I don't know. I guess a lot of me feels like I feel like I've been doing a lot of rooting against like people that are like very anti-vax to be like, <laughs> to just to have it go a little bit worse for them right now, you know, but maybe that's not quite where I need to be at and realize that like they're, victims of the talk piece of Fox news and what have you. And they're just like getting duped by the media system. And, you know, like Tucker Carlson is vaccinated, but he's like, keeps spewing shit. You know what I mean? About how bad it is to get vaccinated. So it's like, it's a good, good idea about like who, who the victims are. Right. And yeah, like it's, I shouldn't just root against people that are unvaxxed. Cause like, really, that's not how we're going to like change the world for the better, you know? But sometimes it feels easier to do that. So yeah, it does. I definitely know that, that, that feeling. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, but I think you're right. Like we ha- should feel empathy for people who fall prey to anti-vax ideology. Um, mm-hmm. and while doing what we said before, like holding our boundaries, like not going to like go and try to argue them or like do anything for them, you know, necessarily, but just offer them compassion if they're willing to meet me halfway or something like that, you know, have a conversation yeah. or yeah. um, Something like that. It's like a tricky thing because like you're right that can get into like a really toxic situation of like trying to help someone like that. I guess it also goes to like no saviors, like not going to save those people, um, but can offer them compassion, whatever that looks like, probably different things in different scenarios. Um, Mm. Yeah. But I, I think more compassion is good as long as it is not like confused for, uh, bending over backwards or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I was just thinking of a, a quote from a TV show I'm watching, Brooklyn Nine Nine, where they're getting ripped off by like a pyramid scheme. And one of the guys is like, okay, we just need to pay $10,000, uh, to get out of this. Or they're like, it's just a, a $10,000 fee and you'll get out of the Nutra. Nutra boom, like pyramid scheme. He's like, okay, great. Yeah, that's no problem. Thank you so much. And does that include gratuity? 
And they're like, <laughs> it's like, all right, we don't need to bend over backwards for capitalism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, you want to get into the sword and the shield? Um, well, I'm looking at our app and we're low on time and I, I want to get to, to our joke. So maybe that's just like homework for us and our listeners to think about, like in, in the fight for a more just world, what swords and shields do you bring? Um, and like Valerie saying that we all play a role. So, um, and our strengths should be something we, we think about. Um, and those can be like very different things. So yeah, like that thought. Mm, that's good, Bob. Yeah. I know the listeners want to hear one though, Bob. You got to give them one, Bob. Give them one sword or shield that you bring. Oh yeah. I guess, um, I was thinking about, uh, like this, probably my, one of my better shields are, is like listening to people and trying to, be a witness or be like some one that people can talk to um, and and go to in moments of being challenged. So yeah. And like trying to create space for that. Oh yeah. I talked about this last week in the show, like creating space, holding space for people. I think is one of my primary ones. That's good. Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's a good spot to leave it. I like the, intention of leaving leaving it open to find like to know your own strengths can be really important because then we can nurture those and you I gotta give us one too Dave yeah um, I guess my one of my big strengths in these battles is a shield too and it's the idea that um just like trying to bridge um, communication through community and I use charm to do that. I like to be <laughs> the, I like to be the person that is willing to be there for other people and fight the battle, but also um, to have a good time while we do it. I don't know. Maybe that's not quite it, but there's something there. <laughs> there's something there. Yeah, bring the joy, bring the celebration, bring mm-hmm. the fun. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Bring the fun. Bring in the noise, bring in the funk. Okay, Bob, um, I'll give the coordinates this week. Go for it. We are located on the interwebs at thrivingindystopia.com. You can download us on Spotify or Stitcher or iTunes. Just kidding. I mean, you can, but um, I don't know why I said that. Uh, I put a new TikTok up this week and I went back to public. So come find me at Dave Peachtree. You'll enjoy, you'll enjoy it out there. Uh, yep. Instagram thriving in dystopia with some underscores. B maze at Twitter and email. E- or you can send us a Christmas letter, you know, right there. Oh, nice. Dave, P- Dave Peachtree at gmail.com. All right, Bob, shall we get into it? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm the first jokes, joke teller. Oh, you ready, Dave? Yeah, I'm so okay. ready. How do you organize a space party? How? You plan it. Oh, very nice, Bob. Well, I feel like a piece of this, Bob, we got to know is just the attitude that we bring to our joke telling. And I really want, I want you to tell me what you think the best thing about Switzerland is. Mm. I don't know, Bob, but I, I want you to know the flag is a big plus, just to let you know that. Pretty good. Pretty good. All right, Dave. What did the photon say when asked if she needed to check a bag? What's that? No thanks, I'm traveling light. Oh, that's not good, Bob. You didn't get me on that one. All right, Helvetica, Times New Roman, walk into a bar. 
And the bartender says, hey, get out of here. We don't serve your type. More of a font than a type, but... (laughs) All right. You got me, Bob. (laughs) Yes. More of a font than a type. Nice. All right. We need a little work on these, don't we, Bob? Yeah, we do. Sorry, listeners. We'll get it next time. (laughs) Uh, Well... Love you, Bob. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for the fireside chat. Love you too, Dave. Good luck in that oven. Oh, yeah. I need it. What's up, Driving Crew? Bob and Dave want to take a second to thank you for lending them your ears. They also want to thank the artists for making everything a little more beautiful. The intro song is In Heaven by Drake Stafford. Our audio is edited by the consummate and dexterous Nadir Chayetch. Web design by Chris the Mixer Sawyer. And of course, visual art is by the prolific and enigmatic Joe Shine. The outro song to season 8 is Captain Jack by Kimoru Crew. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Des sauvages fabriquent un radeau Un jour voyant au large ce qu'ils croyaient un bateau On le prit à bord et en fit un pirate Commençant la légende de Jack Captain Jack, Captain Jack Est arrivé de loin Aujourd'hui encore on chante le refrain Des pirates acadiens